is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. We should never lose sight of the fact that he is worthy to be praised. And my worst day, he is still an awesome, incredible God who is worthy to be praised. And every opportunity that we get, we ought to lift him up and magnify him and glorify his great name. I know it is hard for us to wrap our minds around it, to wrap our finite mind around it, to wrap our mind that is still bothered and plagued by sin, to wrap it around the fact that all of eternity, one of our first order of business is to praise God. Are you with me? Amen. And we're talking about round the clock, even though there won't be any clock. <laughs> but... It is all of eternity where we will be praising Almighty God. So while I'm here, may as well I get some practice. Hello, somebody. Amen. May as well, so that when I become who I was created and designed to be, then I can perfect my praise. Is that all right, somebody? Yes. So until then, I'm going to bless the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. Right where you are, just lift those hands and magnify his name. I'm reminded that he is the lily of the valley. He is the sweet rose of Sharon. He is the bright and morning star. He is the fairest of 10,000. He is God Almighty. He is awesome in all his ways. He is incredible. He is exceptional. He is glorious, he is wonderful, he is gracious, he is loving, he is merciful, he is kind, hallelujah. So we pause to worship, we pause to lift him up, we pause to bless him, we pause to, to magnify his great name. He is worthy to be praised, hallelujah. Every opportunity we get, especially when we come together for corporate worship, we must focus our attention on worshiping the King of Glory. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, the Bible said praise is comely for the upright. It is something that I desire to do. It is something that I want to do. I will bless the Lord at all times and, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall take her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Oh, hallelujah. We glorify your great name tonight. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. He's a wonderful God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 he is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, we bless your great name, I don't know about you, but God has been good to me, Amen. and I want to let you know that the closer I get to him, the more I want to worship him, amen, and the closer I get to him, the more excited I become in my spirit and in my soul. Hallelujah. And so if you see me acting crazy, I just love my Jesus. I don't know about you, but I, I, I have an idea of the things that he has done for me. Hello, somebody. Hallelujah. And for that, I am grateful. I'm grateful for the gift of life for one more Thank God that he woke us up this morning and he clothed us in our right minds and he set us on our way. There, there, there are many people today who would love to be engaged in the things that we're engaged in, but they're physically incapable of doing so. There are those who are in a hospital bed. There are those who have been locked away in prison. But we thank God tonight that we have the freedom, we have the ability, and we have the know-how to worship our God and to be able to do the things we do. Yes, amen. So we bless the Lord. Hallelujah. 
we come tonight to continue to study his word. We're in the book of Romans. I'm going to call your attention back to the book of Romans. And for those who have joined us online, we certainly want to thank you. I know over the past couple of weeks, we've been having a bit of glitches. And my technical team, for the sake of heaven, fix it. For the sake of heaven, just fix it. And make sure everything run right the way how it's supposed to be run. Not 99.9% .9 of the time, but 100% of the time. We have grace to enable us to do that. Is that all right? Yes. Amen. 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 So we want to bless those who are watching online. We appreciate you. We have uh, our YouTube subscription is growing. They're not giving, though. Sister, they're not giving. The numbers are growing, but they're not giving. Let me look at the camera and say it. I'm zooming you in, sir. <laughs> Praise God for that. Praise God. Praise God. The, 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 the numbers are growing, but they're not giving. And I want our technical team or ministry team that handle the technology part of it to make sure they have the access out there to give because the Bible tells us that money answers all things. Amen, somebody? Amen. The Bible said that money answers all things and we cannot run the church without money. So, the numbers are growing in terms of um, viewers but we would like for you to give. I'm going to tell you again, let me post a little bit. We have an incredible ministry here at Vision of Hope Church of Amen. God. Amen. Yes, we have we an do. incredible ministry. Amen. And when you find a good ministry that you can invest in, you should invest. You should not hesitate. Amen. Amen. So may I encourage us, you can sell your gifts, you can sell it to 954-296-7475. You can go to the church website, visionofhopecog.org, and you can click on the donate button from there, and it will walk you through the process. You can learn some things about the ministry, and... We have hundreds of sermons in our library. You can go back and you can have access to them. You can watch at your convenience. And you can study and you can learn. Amen? Amen. Gotta put some commercial inside. Amen. Are we ready to get back into the Word on tonight? If I'm acting crazy, I still have a lingering anointing from Sunday night. So if I'm acting crazy, I still have some lingering anointing. So if I'm not following the script, forgive me. Amen? That's all right. But we're going we're gonna to study. We're going to study. We're going to study. One of the things that you need to understand as it relates to my anointing, I don't know about yours, I know about mine. One of the things you need to understand about my anointing, sometimes it takes me hours or days to unwind from the anointing. Amen. Literally. Amen now. Literally. There were Sundays after through preaching and literally have to beg the Lord to allow me to fall asleep because I just can't sleep. I'm just unwinding from the anointing. So, I still have residue, but we're going to get into the Word. So, we're going back to the book of Romans. We are, last time we were here, we stopped at the end of chapter 5. And just a bit of a recapping from where we left off. We talk about the fact that one man's disobedience um, caused the entire 
word to be um, thrown in chaos. Verse number 19 tells us, it says, For us, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. One of the things that we need to pay attention to when we are reading the Bible, uh, we need to pay attention in, uh, to the tense in which the, the, the text is written. Those tense means a lot to, to what the Lord is saying to us. And if you notice, it, it says, for, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made um, were made sinners. So, in other words, is that, and we all understand again from um, Romans 3 uh, and verse um, I, for 6, verse 23, it tells us that it says, All have sinned. And it tells us that the wages of sin is that it tells us that we were born in sin. So, the term here Paul uses is the reality that everyone that comes into this world came into this world a sinner. Are you with me? And then, not only is one man's disobedient um, cast it through the world into uh, complete chaos, the Bible also talks about one man's obedience in the same context in verse number 9. But this is something I want you to pay close attention to here in that same verse number 19. There, look at the second part of it. It says, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I want you to look at the futuristic of the text, shall be made. So in other words, because there are those today who ascribe to, to, to this concept and this belief of universal salvation. In other words, they believe that every person is going to be saved because Jesus Christ died for every person. Yes, he died for every person. He died for every sin, past, present, and future. Every sin that has been committed and will be committed, the death of Jesus Christ covers it all. Are you with me? Amen. However, however, Unlike how it happened under Adam, in Jesus Christ, in order for a person to experience salvation and redemption, he or she will have to confess and accept. Are you with me? Yes. He or she will have to concept, uh, confess and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you notice again the clause in the verse, it says, Many shall be made. So in other words, not everybody will be saved. Unfortunately, the Lord himself said, It is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We all know by now that not every person is going to be saved. Not that God is not able to save them, but again, every person that will be saved will be saved the same way faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and they will have to confess and acknowledge their sins. Are you with me? Amen. Right, so we talk about that. We talk about the fact also that the law was given to ensure that the offense might stand. The law was given to ensure that the offense might stand, and not only stand, but multiply or abound or increase. And we find that in verse number 20. Moreover, the law was entered that the offense might abound. In other words, again, we spoke about that where there is no law, even though sin was active into the world, man was not held personally accountable for his sin because there was no law to say that, oh, you just break this law, you just did that. So when the law was given, now every man... Uh, fall short of the law. We also talk about the fact that where sin abounds, grace did much more to abound. Same place in verse number 20. It says here, but where sin abound, grace did 
much more uh, to about. We talk about uh, sin reign unto death, uh, but Jesus Christ, our grace reign unto life eternal. Verse um, number 21. It says that, that as sin had reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And we jump right into chapter 6. Uh, let me read a couple of verses and then we start studying. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we continue? How shall we that are dead to sin live any, any longer therein? Know he not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse number 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Alright, so let us jump in at verse number 1 here. So Paul continued and he stated between verse 19 and 21 of chapter 5, that um, sin came into this world. Again, he just reiterated the fact that uh, sin came into this world as a result of one man, and also redemption and righteousness were made available. Our grace became accessible and made available again to one man, which is the man Christ Jesus. And the Bible refers to, to Adam as the first man and refers to Jesus Christ as the last Adam. So, we find that, and then Paul continued by saying, where sin abounds, grace did much more to abound. Or where sin um, prevailed, grace overrides and grace supersedes. So in other words, there is sufficiency of grace to cover every offense that man can commit. It. And so watch this now, verse number one of chapter six. So he made a point, and now he's asking a rhetorical question. Look at it. What shall we say then? Is it a two-part question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I want us to understand here in chapter 6 and verse number 1. This question is not referring to sinners. This question is a question to the church. This is a question to believers. This is a question to those who are saved. So Paul outlined the principle and the process of grace and how grace covers all our offenses and cover all our sins. But he go on to ask the church, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because again, his statement prior to that was that where sin abound, grace did much more to abound. So grace supersedes, grace override. So he asks the question now, the son says, uh, what are we saying? What am I saying to you? What am I saying to the church? Uh, should we continue in sin because we know that all sins are going to be forgiven? And of course we know what the answer is like. So let me see here. Uh, if you're right in point number one tonight is God's grace can keep you away from sin. God's grace can keep you away from sin. God's grace can keep you away from sin. As you survey the body of Christ, you will find a couple of observations that I have made, and one of them is that the Bible tells us that my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. 
The other things that you will find in the body of Christ is that many of us are very selfish. And because we think that we, we talk about grace and we don't understand the principle and the process of grace, some of us as believers feel as if we can just go and just do anything and just go ask God for forgiveness. And the truth is, yes, you can do it. You can do it. You can go out there and you can sin and you can ask God for forgiveness and he's going to forgive you. You can go out there and sin today and confess that sin, our sins, and he forgives you and you go back tomorrow again and you do the same exact thing over and it would appear as if that's the first time you have ever committed that sin. Because the grace of God covers our faults and covers our sin. But here is the issue though. Here is the issue. Here is the issue. And we're going to go get into it a bit deeper in, in, in the text. One of the things we must understand about grace is that grace is not a license for us to sin. Grace does not give us the authority or the authorization to just get up and live any way and anyhow. If you find a person who claim to be a Christian and they are living any and anyhow and telling you that the grace of God covers it and all of that stuff there, you got to ask yourself a couple of questions. One, is this person really saved? Are you with me? Because if the person is saved, the Bible let us know that transformation would have taken place in the heart and the soul of that individual. And if transformation has taken place, uh, after you have gotten saved, the Holy Ghost, God in the person of the Holy Ghost, takes up residence in your heart or in our heart. And if the Holy Ghost is living in our heart, if the Holy Ghost take up residence in our heart, one of the things, or one of the, 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 the role of the Holy Ghost is to lead us into all truth and is to teach us how to live holy and how to live righteous. The Holy Spirit is not an author of confusion or of sin. So therefore, if you see a person that says, I am saved, but they are living like a devil, you've got to really ask some serious question, is this person really saved? Alright? So let's say you get past that question and you are 95% convinced that he or she is saved. The next question you will ask yourself is that, how much that person really loved Jesus? How much? Because if that person really loved Jesus, and if that person understood what Jesus had to go through to redeem their life, then they would, have, they would do everything within their power to refrain from from sin. Are you with me somebody? So Paul asks the question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin. That grace may abound. Shall we continue living as sinners. Just to prove that the grace of God is sufficient. That's the question. That's, that's, that's what he's asking the church. And he wasn't asking sinners. He was writing and he included himself as well. What shall we, what all of us, what collectively as believers, what shall we say to these things? And he asked the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He continued in verse number two and he said, God forbid 
How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you are writing, you can write down, we are supposed to be dead to sin. We are supposed to be dead to sin. Every child of God who have accepted Christ, the Bible tells us that we are dead to sin. Are you with me? We are dead to sin. Now, I do not have to try to explain to any one of us about something that is dead. Because every one of us have encountered something that has been dead and we know the result of something that has been dead. It is lifeless, it is useless, it is of no value, it is of no significance because the thing is dead. Are you with me? Paul is saying, so the same way how a thing that is dead, life has no power over it any longer. So he's saying that when you and I Give our heart to Jesus Christ. The Bible declares that we now become dead to sin. Let me give my, second, my next point and then I'll come back to that. Spiritually, your sin nature has been put to death. Spiritually, your sin nature has been put to death. Let's jump down to verse number 3 and we come back up. So spiritually, your sin nature has been put to death. Look down at verse number 3 and we come back up to verse 2. Know he not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So the Bible tells us, the apostle here is telling us, that when we came to Christ and when we were baptized, water baptism and confession of faith, when we were baptized, we were baptized into his death. So the Bible said that something took place spiritually where our sin nature has been put to death, if you will. The truth of the matter is, because we are still here, and because we are still living in a sinful world, every one of us will have to deal with that sin nature nonetheless. Are you with me? We call it the Adamic nature, that which we are born with. But we must also understand that you and I also have a spiritual nature as well. So right now we are here and we possess or we are dealing with two natures. We are dealing with the Adamic nature and we are also now dealing with the nature of Christ, the spiritual nature that has been given to us in our new birth. Are you with me? So, the Bible said that the old man has been crucified. The old man has been put to death. But the issue and the challenge and the problem is, though the old man has been put to death spiritually, guess what happened? The carrier of the old man is still around and has so become attached to that sin nature in the past that he or she can resurrect it at any time. Are you with me? But I promise you, um, saints, that if we strive to love God 
and to please God. I'm not saying we can live this life here on earth without sinning, but we can sure live a life of righteousness and holiness where sin does not have any control or dominance in our life. Are you with me, somebody? There's a difference between a person who's a Christian who allows sin to have dominance because there are believers who have allowed sin uh, to have dominance in their lives and there are believers who get up with a conscious desire every day to wrestle and to strive not to sin and to live a life of holiness. So there's a difference between the two. So Paul here says, well, what shall we say? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Then he went on and said, no, God forbid. Let me read it from the NIV. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it? any longer. So again, when we come to Christ, and when we accept Him as Lord and Savior, and when we understand spiritually, and according to the Word of God, the Bible said, you and I are now become dead to sin. Are you with me, somebody? We become dead to sin. So, so, so the question is, why am I still sinning? Okay? Couple of reasons. I'm still sinning because, let's say I was just a new, young Christian. I'm only six months old, two, two years old as a child of God. So I'm struggling more. I'm, I'm getting to understand. But when you have been saved for 10 years, when you have been saved for 20 years, when you have been saved for, for 30 years and you are still committing those sins like what you were committing when you just got saved for six months, something is seriously wrong with you not growing in grace. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is every one of us must seek to grow in grace, grow in the understanding. And again, especially in the time and the day in which we are living in, where everybody wants to think the microwave way, they gotta have it right away, it gotta get done right away. You find that better at doing the things. That's the point. Look at look at it. I'm not saying there weren't issues with the saints of old, you know. But when you survey the body of Christ and you look at those church leaders, pastors and those who serve in high calling in ministry. When you, when you look back 100 years back, when you look back 50 years back, 70 years back, when you look back, what you will realize is that for whatever reason, those believers seem to be able to live a life of holiness, a life beyond reproach. But one of the things that you will find about them as well as you do your research, you will find that they were people who spent more time in the word of Almighty God. Let me say this to us tonight. If you are not spending time in the word of God, and if you are not spending time in prayer, and if fasting is not a part of your life, you are setting up yourself as a Christian for failure. You are setting up yourself for failure. The psalmist declare, How shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word of Almighty God. The right hand tells us, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Let me tell you something. If I tell you today that I slip and made a mistake and sin, that's a second sin we just commit because I'm like Metal. I'm like Metal. I didn't slip. I knew exactly what I was doing. 
Hello. I know exactly what I was doing. Because when you have the word of God in you, you are not going to escape the filter of the Holy Ghost. You are not. If you are going to go out there to sin, there's going to be a conversation on the inside before you committed that act. You can choose to override him. How may I say? One of the interesting things with the Holy Ghost living on the inside, he does not take away our autonomy. He does not control us to the point where we don't have any control to make decisions on our own. He encourages us. He, he, he impresses us. He nudges us. He does things to help us to get the message. But I am telling you that you can choose to disobey. Hello? But, so, here, so here's the thing now. As a child of God, and the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you, and you are studying the Word, it will keep you away from sinning. Are you with me, somebody? It will keep you away from sinning. The more time you spend in the presence of Almighty God, is the less time you're going to get drawn into sin. Are you with me? Spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in fasting. Especially uh, in the eras in which we, we have our struggles. Spend time talking to God and studying the Word and crying out to God. Holy Ghost, I really want to overcome this and I promise you, He will help you. Are you with me? So it says here, he said, no, he said, God forbid, we cannot continue because why? Why? We are dead to sin and therefore we should no longer live in sin. That's Paul's message to the church. And he said, know ye not that as many of us as were baptized, we were baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death. So that baptism that we go through, water baptism, and if you're writing again, you can write one of the symbolism of uh, water baptism uh, here is burial. You can, one of the symbols of water baptism is uh, burial. So baptism here symbolizes, one of the symbols of baptism is that the Bible tells us that symbolically we are buried so the same way Christ was crucified and he was buried, he was placed in the heart of the ground and he spent a couple of days in the ground. The Bible said when we go to water baptism, when we accept Christ and we go down, that is why, and I'm not teaching on baptism, but that is why baptism must always be by immersion. Meaning that you must go on. So, I was baptized when I was younger, you know, where you hold your head over the thing and then pour the water <laughs> across the floor. That's not immersion. <laughs> All right, so, so, so I was baptized at Catholic too. Yeah, I was baptized a Catholic. I grew up in I, I grew up in the Catholic Church. So and you would hit and put a wall put a wall over your head. But thank God for grace. Amen. Because again, pouring the water over a person's head does not symbolize a burial. So baptism must be by immersion. Because symbolically, 
it represents that that individual, he or she, when they publicly confess Christ and when they are baptized, the Bible said, what we are buried with him in baptism. So through the water baptism, we symbolize Christ. You die in my place. And so now, I'm symbolically, I am dying to the sin that I've committed. Are you with me? So that's what it's saying here. So it says, we were baptized into Christ. Uh, it says here, those of us, so many of us, as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Verse number four. So in other words, now, when we, when we accept the Christ and we're baptized, so there's something in us that should have died, and that is what? That sinful nature. That sinful nature should have been dead. Again, Again, spiritually, that is correct, but um, practically speaking, because we're still here in the flesh, we will have to deal with that old man until the last day on earth. So here, here's the situation now. As long as we are here, that old man can raise its head. It is now your responsibility, it is now my responsibility as to whether or not I want to let sin reign. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. it, is, it now becomes my choice. And yes, I understand there are those younger Christians who don't understand the principle and who are not as strong and mature in the Lord, I understand their struggle, but when you get to a certain stage in your Christian walk, you must be at a place of maturity where you can control, if you will, your behavior in terms of pleasing God and living righteous and living holy. And we can live holy. One of one of the things that I struggle with, and I hear great preachers and pastors and theologians use the term, but I will never agree with them with the term. Because they will look at you and they will tell you that I am a sinner saved by grace. Present continuous tense. I am a sinner saved by grace. No, that's not me. That's not me. Not at all. I was a sinner was saved by grace. Amen. I don't care how you think I behave today. I'm a saint who was having a bad day. Hello, somebody. Amen. If there is one thing the Catholic Church has gotten right, is that they refer to everybody as a saint. When I was growing up in the Catholic Church, and you hear the word saint, you cringe. <laughs> because you, you, you think that there was some, some, some supernatural something that takes place, and, and this Saint Benedict, Saint this and Saint that, Saint Joseph. And... Mm -hmm. But what I've learned over time is that the Catholic refers to the believer as saint. And rightly so, we are saint. We might be Pentecostal saint, but we are saints. Mm -hmm. Are you with me, somebody? Yes. So, so here's what we do now. When we tell ourselves that we are sinners saved by grace, and we, we refer to it in the present continuous tense, we are setting up ourselves for the devil to gain entrance and to take advantage and disadvantage, if you will. Because we don't understand that the words that we speak, that, that there is there, an there entity out there that is waiting upon every word that comes out of our mouth. And there, those entities are going to use those words for either to bring good or bad influence around us and in our lives. Are you with me? 
My family can tell you that I teach them to speak a particular way. You're not going to hear, and if they do it, it's a slip up. You're not going to hear any one of my family members say, My headache. Right. Amen. You're not going to hear it. Amen. You're not going to hear them say, My this my. or my that. My. Because what you're in essence you're doing, you're taking ownership yes. for something that does not belong to you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And every time you take the ownership, you are confessing that this thing belongs to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you want to get rid of this thing here, and you are praying to get rid of this thing, but you just contradict your prayer because you're going right back to say, my this, my that, my this, my that. No, there are some things in life that has no bearing on me. I am dealing with a condition or an issue. It's not mine. It's passing by somewhere and just somehow accidentally um, stop at my residence. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm <laughs> Are, are you with me, somebody? Yes. So, we go back to the statement. So, so I don't consider myself, uh, I don't use the phrase that I am a sinner saved by grace. grace. Yes. I was. I, I get where they're coming from. But we've got to be very careful because now, if you're not in the Word and you'll be using, jumping around in, with those phrases, guess what happened? The devil is going to make you feel like a sinner every single day. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. Let me tell you something. As you grow in grace, as you grow in grace, you will understand some things about the Holy Ghost on the inside of you and about the Lord Jesus Christ that you serve. And there are some days that I am struggling. And I can say to the Lord, I thank you that even though I didn't pray the way how I should pray this week, or even though I didn't pray the way how I should pray today, I thank you that it did not mess with my fellowship. Amen. Hello. Amen. Because there are days when I'm not going to be able to pray the way how I used to. Normally pray. I want to pray. True. But if I don't understand the, the Holy Ghost, and if I don't understand the grace, and if I don't understand the Lord Jesus Christ, then I'm going to feel as if I'm the worst sinner in the world. And the devil is going to play a guilt trip on me. So when he comes and tries to play those guilt trips, I just say, Lord, I thank you that nothing interrupts my fellowship. Nothing interrupts my sweet communion. I don't have to run around the, the, the church seven times to maintain fellowship and sweet communion with the Holy Ghost. I don't have to. Are you with me, somebody? Yes. So, so we must understand. So Paul is saying here that, listen, when we were baptized, uh, we were buried into, uh, we were baptized into his death. Watch this now. Therefore, verse number four, therefore we are what we are buried with him into death. So, again, when we come to Christ and we are baptized, the Bible tells us that we are buried with him um, by baptism into his death. So my old Adamic nature should have been buried and have been buried. But again, remember we are still here, we are still going through a process. But if we are mindful of these things, we can, we, we can live a more victorious life. We can live a life of righteousness and a life of holiness. Again, the Bible tells us my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Look, so it says that like as Christ was raised up from the dead 
by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. So, when a person comes to the Lord, and I understand it's a process, I get it, I get it. But the Bible is telling us that when a person comes to Christ, confess their sins, and when they get to the point of water baptism, hmm. the Bible said when he or she comes out of that pool or that lake or that pond or whatever, you are looking at a brand new person. The features might be there and everything, but the Bible is saying spiritually, you are looking at a brand new person. And when we understand these principles, it will help us to refrain from sinning. Let's cover a few more verses before we close. So it says here, verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So Paul says, not only are we buried, not only have we died through the process of our baptism symbolizing, but the fact that Christ was raised, we must also be raised and walk in the newness of life. Amen. And does that newness of life mean that I won't sin? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that you and I must be conscious of our position and our state in, in salvation and in grace and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his grace is sufficient and his grace can sustain us. Verse number 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man, that is the Adamic nature, our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's a mouthful right there. Because there's a whole lot of complexity that we got to deal with. It's a whole lot of complexity. But what Paul is trying to get his audience to understand and what he's trying to get us to understand is that when we come to Jesus Christ, when a person gives their heart to the Lord, there's a spiritual operation that has taken place and, and some, the manifestation or the full manifestation of that operation will not be realized until we get to glory. But the, we can live out the process and we can live victoriously because the reality is that we have been empowered through the grace of God, through the Holy Ghost, to live victoriously. We have been, and, and once the Holy Ghost is living on the inside, once we are saved, watch this now, you can really know if a person is saved. Just listen to the way how they talk. Listen to how they talk. And one of the things that you will hear when a person just gets saved, some of the things you will hear is that they will say to you, I don't know what happened, but I don't have the desire for this anymore. I don't have the desire for that anymore. I don't like this kind of music anymore. I don't like these jokes anymore. I don't this, I don't that. And they say, I don't know how it happened. It happens because a spiritual operation has taken place and has changed some things on the inside of that person. But even though the operation has taken place, if the individual does not take responsibility to, to practice what has taken place, then guess what? He or she will continue in sin as if they're never saved. Are you with me? Amen. Listen, one of the things that I tell persons who have done any kind of a medical procedure is this. 
make sure you follow your doctor's instruction. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for it. Because the doctor could have done the greatest job if you don't follow the doctor's instruction after you've been discharged from the, from, from the hospital. If you don't follow the doctor's instruction, there's a great percentage that you're going to end up worse than before the procedure. Are you with me, somebody? Yeah. Why? It is not because the doctor did no good job. It is because you disobey and you did not follow the advice of the doctor. Yes. Why did I say all of that? It is the same way when a person gets saved, a spiritual operation and a process has taken place. But if he or she don't congregate around believers, don't go to church, don't study the word, don't seek to grow, the same thing that will happen to the person physically is going to happen to that person spiritually. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. It is a reason why we encourage young Christians and Christians in general not to go certain places, not to do certain things. It's not because we are born killers. No. But it is a reason for it. Because if you keep going back to the old habit, if you keep going back to the old places, guess what happened? After a while, the temptation of the world and the lure of the enemy is going to suck the person right back to where they're coming from. Are you with me, somebody? So therefore, when a person gets saved, Paul is saying here, in essence, we have everything that we need by the grace of God to live a life of righteousness, to live a life of holiness. And we also have been given enough safeguard so we can stay away from sin. But again, in our day and time, we have a major problem. Because guess what? We are not spending time in the Word. I love technology, and technology is good. But I still believe that every Christian needs a hard copy of the Bible. I still believe every Christian needs a hard copy of the Bible. Saints, maybe 25 years or so ago, I think it was a Sunday night, somewhere between Sunday and Tuesday night, I'm sitting in my living room studying the Word of God. And with my two eyes, I saw the word elevated off the pages of Scripture. I saw the word elevated, lift up off the Scripture right before my eyes. Right there. I saw the word lift up, just elevated right off the page. And it quickly reminded me that God said, my words are life and they are spirit. I'm not saying it can't happen with an electronic device, but I'm still convinced that every Christian needs a hard copy of this good book here. I believe there is an experience that you can get from a hard copy of this book that you can never get anywhere else. Maybe I'm from old school. Maybe I'm from old school. But I just believe that the traditional um, traditional old hardcover copy of this book here is one of the greatest things that we can ever have. And when we spend time in it, when we embrace it, you notice that um, not even preachers bring their Bible to church again. And they make me feel funny when we carry my Bible go everywhere. <laughs> but thank God I have a mind of my own. I can still carry 
So let, we, we're going to close. So God's grace can keep you away from sin. We are supposed to be dead to sin. Spiritually, your sin nature has been put to death. And one of the symbol or the, sim the symbols of water baptism is death. The Bible said we are buried with him. And we must also walk in the newness of life. Saints, I believe that, that the reality is that if every one of us spend more time in the Word of God and spend more time in the presence of God, we will all be better Christians. Rest in your feet. We're going to pray. I can't make you live right. I can't make you live holy. You have to want to do it for yourself. I tell people that I can go up there and live like the devil and still get away with it. But I love Jesus and I love him too much to fail him now. I love him too much to break my vows. I promise the Lord by his grace I will be faithful. Amen, somebody? Amen. And, and, and I love him. So, so when, you, when you're not seeing me, I'm mindful that Jesus is seeing me. And because I'm in love with him, and I'm madly in love with him, by his grace, I'm going to do everything to please him. I'll close with this final thought. One of the ways that I live my Christian life is this. It is my desire every day to put a smile on Jesus' face. I don't want to leave a frown on his face. I want to put a smile on his face. I literally live my life like that. To try to put a smile on the master's face. It is a beautiful thing to see the God of the universe smiling at you. Hello, somebody. It's a beautiful thing. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, mighty God, that we have come together to study. To study to show thyself approved, a work by that to God. Need it not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. There's so much truth in your word, Almighty God, for us to in just a digest. And so, Spirit of the living God, sometimes we feel inadequate, we feel helpless. But mighty God, I pray, I pray that you will help us, Holy Ghost. Help us that we will grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us that we will make it a daily part of our lives to seek to please you. To seek to love you more. To seek to be committed to the things of Almighty God. Would you help us, mighty God? Because we have been called that our light should shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Would you help us to be ex an example to the believers? Would you help us to live right? Would you help us to live holy? Would you help us to refrain from sin? Would you help us, mighty God? Would you help us to help the younger ones, those who are struggling with different kind of temptations and lust and addiction? Would you help us to help them, mighty God, so that they too can grow in grace? Mighty God, help us as we look to you. Be with us, mighty God. Thank you for this time that we have gathered tonight. Thank you for vision of hope, church of God. Thank you for this great ministry that you have given us, mighty God. A place where hope is restored and dreams come alive. Would you bless your people tonight? Would you cover us under your blood? Would you be with us and guide us in all our steps? As we look to you tonight, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor as we celebrate your great name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.
I let the saints declare, amen. amen and amen. Just quickly raise those right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and keep you his peace, both now and forevermore. And again, so saints declare,